From KPU News in Austin, you're watching Texas This Week with Ashley Goodo. Good morning. The Texas 86 legislative session came to an end Monday. A lot happened in those 140 days. So members of the Austin area delegation, Senator Kurt Watson, Representatives Donna Howard, Celia Israel, James Tallarico and Cheryl Cole joined me for a roundtable discussion on the session. Thank you so much for being with us today. We certainly appreciate it. Let's start by talking uh, about overall thoughts on the session, how this session was compared to the last session. Uh, Senator Watson, we're going to start out with you. Sure. Well, it was a much better session than the last session. Last session was dominated and I, by uh, red meat you know, issues where it created great division and fight. Uh, this session we came in having uh, worked during the interim on the school finance uh, commission and having that as a platform so we actually came in with the idea that we're going to try to do something that we have the political will for and the money for and that was really address uh, school finance and reforms and so that kind of drove the session overall as kind of an overriding uh, point. Mm -hmm. Representative Howard. Oh, well I agree with what uh, the senator says we came in with money. That's always a game yes. changer. Uh, we came in with an election that changed the makeup of the body, especially on the House side. Mm -hmm. um, it, we came in with uh, pent up frustration, I think, on the part of voters that, hey, you guys are not paying attention to the things that are going to make a difference in the day to day lives of Texans. Right. And we want to see that happen. So, and we, of course, had a new speaker. Uh, all of those things, and probably more, mm -hmm. uh, shaped this into a very different session, much better session. As I said before, we, it was a pretty low bar we had to get above. But, but we'd had a, we had a good session. I think everybody came out pr pretty much thinking we had a good session. You know, I was telling everybody before the session started, because we knew the, the mandate that the voters had given us, we knew the balance that had been given us, I said, if we do it right, everybody goes home with a trophy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that trophy is, um, more support for our teachers and our school uh, support staff and our children and pre-k and all of the above we didn't know we were going to get it but we knew we were going to aim for it and uh, so in the sense at the end of the day we were all we're all I think not only relieved because <laughs> the 140 days is over but I, we all did go home with a trophy and that was a significant uh, influx of revenue into our public school system. I asked the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, I sat down with him for an interview and I asked him to describe the session in one word oh, and he said his one word, no, he said his one word was teamwork <laughs> and that that was teamwork between the big three. So, so like him. <laughs> teamwork between the senators, teamwork between the members and then teamwork for everyone, everyone working together to pass uh, these reforms. You guys, you, you made some mumbles but do you agree or disagree? Well, one, one man's teamwork is another woman's tug of war. Uh, but uh, I was not in the room when it happened. But I, but I, but I do think, from our perspective, it was, it was helpful that uh, we had a more, we had a more moderate house. We had a speaker who, who wanted to, uh, I think, be that, be that, uh, uh, negotiator with the governor and the lieutenant governor, and not shy away from them, but rather get in there with them and, and, and scramble with them. In that sense, Speaker Bonin, I think, was the right man uh, for the job in the year in which we needed to focus on one big issue. It was clearly not as acrimonious as in the past. And, and where I will um, say that, that the word teamwork plays out is you saw some things that you hadn't seen before. For example, uh, Representative Talarico just mentioned um, I was on the, the conference committee for HB3. I think in a different session that probably would not have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, this was my first session to be on the Education Committee. We went into the session knowing that this was going to be a big deal in that regard and the fact that he put me on the Education Committee, then put me on the working group to deal with revenue and then on HB3's conference committee was a sign that uh, he was looking in some instances for trying to create more teamwork. Um, that didn't happen in every instance, I might add. And I, I, I hope and believe that he looks back on that now and says that teamwork and that effort to create bipartisan teamwork paid off. And I think it's important to look at the teamwork from the perspective of so many new freshmen that even the very concept of what it means to be a freshman from what actually happened changed because 
not only was I on Ways and Means, James was on public ed. Several freshmen were on appropriations. The speaker did not take that sort of attitude into it. He just wanted to get the work done, and he wanted the diversity of the new people coming in. He valued that. As a freshman, I, I, w I happened to be the youngest member in the legislature, and Speaker Bonham was the youngest member when he first got elected. So, you know, he um, certainly kind of took me under his wing and provided some advice, both political and personal, about how to navigate um, this, this place when you're that young. Um, but I agree, kind of you know, what Senator Watson said about uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick is true with Speaker Bonin. You know, when he looked at all the members who wanted to be on the Public Education Committee, he asked me to serve on it because of my experience as a teacher in the classroom, even though I'm a swing seat Democrat. And he got some pushback um, politically for putting a Democrat in a vulnerable seat on such a high profile committee. But he did it anyway because he wanted practitioners at the table when these conversations were happening. And so I think that's a, a perfect example of putting people or putting kids before politics, which I think is exactly the message voters sent in the last election. Everyone at this table voted against Senate Bill 2. Am mm -hmm. I correct in mm -hmm. that? That mm -hmm. is the bill that would uh, reduce the rollback rate, which is how much cities and counties can increase your property taxes without voter approval from 8% to 3.5%. It takes it all the way down to 2.5% for schools. You're all giving me the death look. Now. <laughs> um, let's talk about why you guys voted against it. Well, it's a show vote. It's not, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna really reduce property taxes. Um, and it in my view, is was set up to be an effort by those in control of the capital to blame somebody else for their high property taxes when really the cause of their high property taxes was because those in control of the capital had refused time and time again to fix the school finance system. So they needed somebody else to blame. Uh, the public smartened up on that real quick and realized that, that that's not right and that's part of the reason we've got HB3. <laughs> but SB2 is, is not going to lower people's property taxes, and I believe it will do real damage to what happens in cities and counties. And, and probably wearing my former mayor hat, I just think those elections where we elect the mayor and council and we elect the county judge and the commissioner's court, and, and that, th those mean something. Those elections matter too. And I shouldn't be making decisions for what the El Paso City Council's doing just like the El Paso senators and representatives shouldn't be making decisions about what the Austin City Council and, and the Commissioner's Court in Travis County do. So it, it's a bad bill and I think it'll have bad ramifications. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with the Senator that we already have property tax caps in the state and they're called elections. Um, and no one wants the Texas legislature to be the city council of Texas. Um, we elect city council members all across our region to do this important work and it's not our job as legislators to interfere with that work. Um, and I think in a lot of ways SB2 was designed to confuse voters and um, luckily our Central Texas voters are smarter than that and they know the driver of local property taxes is your school district bill, uh, which we addressed with a property tax buy down in HB3. But hurting cities and counties is not the way to solve this problem. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the sad truth is that a lot of us at the legislature, we're there for five months every two years, we have to know about all kinds of things don't know as much about some of these things as, as one might wish we did. Um, and I think that it was lost on some of my colleagues for many years that the state was actually benefiting from the property value increases and using those, those extra dollars coming in to pay for things that were not public education related. Mm -hmm. As we were able to get that word out more and more that, hey, we're shifting the cost of the local property taxes, and oh, by the way, it's not even paying for public education. It was an and excuse to step away yes, from the plate. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, to what's being said already, uh, Senate Bill 2 was taking uh, an absolutely nonsensical approach to this. It was not the issue. Uh, it's for political purposes. It's for campaign flyers. Uh, it's to say we we came in and took care of things when really we were the, the culprit all along and we are addressing that but to go back to what we talked about earlier there's still got to be sustainable revenue streams to make this go forward or we're going to find ourselves right back in the same situation we were in before. What I hated the most about the discussions is they were never matched with the services that taxes provide yeah. mm -hmm. and it just left everything confusing. It was the wrong way to do politics. It was just the wrong way to do, I mean, because if you would have asked me 
when uh, I was working and there was a daycare, a city uh, day center, you know, a mile from my house that my Hancock Center, actually, that my kids could walk to, and they did, three boys, and if you had said that that center is going to close at, because of property tax cuts, it's going to have to close at 5 instead of 6.30, and, um, but you can pay $100 more on your property taxes. If I were to move three kids downtown to a daycare, that would have cost me four or $500 more dollars. And that is really going to have to happen. And so I was always encouraging the mayors and county officials, especially the mayors, close the pool in their neighborhood. Close the senior citizen, close it. Just close it, make it real. They don't get it. They just think there's this gap. My property taxes are high, my property taxes are high. But the things that government provides, people need. Now some people say, but this will slow growth, and they see that as a good thing. Well, except that it doesn't slow the growth of the city you live in. Right. <laughs> so um, in Austin, Texas, where we've become a focal point in a worldwide information and knowledge economy, and, and people are moving here every day, and, we, and that creates uh, real needs, uh, it doesn't, that, doesn't, that growth doesn't slow. Those need, the growth of those needs doesn't slow. So in my view, we ought to rely upon the people we elect to make those decisions about how many police per thousand we want, mm -hmm. parks, playgrounds, libraries, uh, day daycare facilities. We ought to rely on the people we elect to make those decisions because the members of the legislature are woefully ill-equipped to make those decisions, and those and those local elections matter. If you don't, if you you think that the property tax growth is going too fast by comparison to the growth of the needs, you have a way to solve that problem, and that is vote for somebody that will do it differently. The Austin delegation and I also talked about transportation, their favorite bills of this session, and the future. You can watch the full conversation on KVU.com. Just click on this story in the Texas This Week section. That's Texas This Week. Now here's what's coming up at 9 a.m. on This Week.